Good morning or good afternoon, depending on what class you are. So we're moving on to the next uh, element of art, which is going to be value. Now value is super duper important because it's what adds the third dimension to a regular drawing. Value is light and dark areas. The light areas are usually referred to highlights. The dark areas are referred to shadows. And anything in between those two are called midtones. Now I have a whole video prepared on this where usually I give you a handout but since we are distance learning, we're going to have to do it a little bit differently. I do have a handout and I'm going to read the handout and then I'm going to give you a different demo than the one I have that's regularly posted on my channel or the one that I share normally in class. This is really important um, because you guys know what dark is. But when you have two values that are very dark, like how do you distinguish the difference between the two if they're not identical? Let me give you an example. Typically in class, what I'll ask students is, okay, well, what color is this? And the students will say black. And I'll say, well, what color is this? And the students will say black. But if I put these on top of one another, they don't disappear. That means that the black is not the same, right? And this is a concept that you have to wrap your head around. Uh, and it's not just for value, but it's also for color. Meaning to say, if I ask you, what color is the grass? You say green. But if you really look at the grass, is it just one green? And this is the biggest mistake or one of the biggest mistakes that beginning artists make is they will say, okay, well, this is black and I'm just going to get my black color pencil and I'm going to make it all black. But if you look at it carefully, well, it's not all black. So right under here, you have what's called a highlight. That means that light is coming from somewhere and reflecting uh, right here. It's very reflective. Here on this side, you have a highlight as well. But is that white? Certainly not. Maybe the swing line is white, but this area right here would still be a very dark value, right? Um, so that is, how do we do that? How do we distinguish between those things? And the answer to that is, well, we have to vary the dark, right? It can't be too dark and it can't be too light. And we want to make it as close as possible to what we're seeing. Uh, and there's a way to compare to know if it's actually working. And that's a very simple technique and you might look silly doing it, but it's just to blur your vision. Now, some of you can do this naturally uh, and some of you can't. Uh, but I find that most people can blur their vision one way or another. Most people, I say usually in class, there's one person out of 40 who just doesn't know how to do it. Uh, one way to do it is just to... Uh, unfocus your eyes. And I know that some of you can do this. This is something I can do. There's a mosquito in here. Uh, it's going to get me. Um, <laughs> this is just by unfocusing your vision. So it's like you're looking at something in the distance, but you're not. Um, another way is just to squint. If you squint enough, then everything becomes blurry. So when you're comparing your drawing to your reference and you squint or you blur your vision, and they look the same, the light areas and the dark areas, then you know you're on the right path. Also, if you have glasses, you could just take them off. That works for some people. And for uh, those of you that don't know how to do it, the best that I can recommend is just squinting, just closing your eyes just enough to where you can barely see anything and everything becomes kind of blurry. And I have a great video that I'm gonna show you uh, that shows how uh, to compare by blurring your vision. And I did it on camera, so it's great. So I can just unfocus the camera and you'll know exactly what I mean. Um, you might not be able to do that to compare because we're going to have to make a value scale without a reference. Usually in class, we would have a reference. But since we're doing the distance learning, like I said, uh, we're going we're gonna to make one without a reference. Okay. Before we actually begin, I want to read the handout as usual. And then I want to show you that video on how to compare value. And then we'll actually create, I'll create a value for you right in this video, um, a value scale, I'm sorry. I don't know if it's gonna be from one to 10, maybe it'll be a little bit less. Um, and that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna start reading the handout soon. Value. Value, the lightness or darkness of tones or colors. White is the lightest value, black is the darkest. The value halfway between these extremes is called middle gray. How is value used in art? Once an object is properly broken down into line, it's time to begin the process of shading. We perceive our world in three dimensions. That means that nothing in the actual world has an outline. 
All things are defined by value, dark, light, and everything in between. As an artist, it's very important to understand that there are many different shades that can be considered black and white. Two common but challenging exercises to make this clear are called white on white study or a black on black study. Three white eggs on a white table. So on the left image, you can see that some eggs have been placed on a white table. On the right image, you can see two black cooking spoons on a black table. The left is an example of a white on white study. And these are exercises that are usually carried out in the college level. And they really help you understand the subtleties between different values. In class, we will categorize different shades of dark by using numbers. As you can see from the images, the eggs are white, but so is the table. If they were the same white, the eggs would become invisible. The same holds true for the spoon. So an artist needs to understand that black and white are not limited or reserved by a single shade. It's also important to understand that lines carry their own value. And if not consistent with the value of the object, that the three-dimensional illusion will be lost. For this reason, it's important to not heavily outline objects. And here you have an example of the lightest stroke and then slightly going to the strongest or the darkest strokes. And it's not very easy to see here. This is a bad copy. This is page two of the handout. So one of the primary jobs for the artist is to control the value, how dark or how light something should be. The two techniques used to darken a line are simple and ultimately succeed in doing the same thing, which is adding more graphite to the paper. The first is by simply applying more pressure with the pencil. This will in turn add more graphite. The next is by using a technique called hatching and cross hatching. With both of these techniques, it's important to regularly sharpen your pencil. You can apply greater pressure on a sharp tip rather than a dull one. When hatching, it's important to lift the pencil from line to line, giving the lines an opportunity to blend successfully. Do not create zigzags. When you cross hatch, you must change the direction of the line to be successful. The next technique is, is used to determine if the value you've created matches the reference. This is also simple and it just involves blurring your vision. Once you blur your vision, details will fade and all that remains is value. You can blur your vision any way you know how, by unfocusing your vision or by removing your glasses if you wear them, or if you can't do any of those, you can simply squint, which is, clo which is to close your eyes to the point where they are barely open. Once you succeed in blurring your vision, you must quickly determine your whitest white and your darkest dark. The value of zero on the value scale will be reserved for your whitest white. The value of 10 will be reserved for your darkest dark. By applying more pressure and using cross hatching, it's your job to match the value. On the left there, you see examples of hatching and cross hatching. Um, on right here at the bottom, you see an example of the image blurred and the image a bit more in focus. I'm going to use the pen right now to show you what hatching and cross hatching are. So I have a note and sometimes I can use the pen. So when you hatch, you go like this. Let me see if I can scroll down. It's not really letting me. But when you hatch, you go like this in one direction. If you zigzag, especially if you have a a pencil, the corners where you zig and you zag, they're gonna build more graphite than the rest. And that's why those marks are more prominent than they should be when you zigzag and you hatch. So when you hatch, make sure you lift the pencil every time. Cross hatching is when you go in the opposite direction, like this. And this helps build graphite as well. Now it's important to change the direction that you're hatching in. So now if we wanted to build even more graphite, we can go from left to right. And that should make it even darker. And it's also covering up those white spots. You wanna make sure that you don't have very many of those white spots. And if we wanted it even darker than that, especially if you're using a pencil, now you could go up and down. So when you hatch, remember, you start diagonally like this. And I'm keeping my lines kind of spaced apart so you can see them better. 
Cross hatching is when you use a line that goes in the opposite direction, like this. Cross hatching, then remember that you have to change the direction so you could go left to right. Then you could go up and down. And then you could do it diagonally again. So those are some examples of hatching and cross hatching. Now looking at these two images, this is an example of what it's supposed to look like normally. And that would be a black on black study because it's so dark. Um, when you blur your vision, it looks like this. Now, if you were to blur your vision and look at both of these images, they should look very, very similar. Let me go back. I know some of you might still be having a hard time uh, blurring your vision or really getting what I'm trying to say as far as comparing the value. I know that there's some of you that got it right away and you're like, wow, that does match up really well. So for those of you that are still struggling, I have another short video for you that I'm going to blur the focus of the camera just to help you see what I'm talking about. And you'll see how perfectly one value matches with the other. So much so that the value that you're creating should disappear into the value that already exists. And if, if that's, if it's not really clear what I mean by that, Watch this next uh, video for like four or five minutes. I think it's four or five minutes. And then hopefully that will help you understand. After this next video, then we'll actually create our own value scale. And that will be the lesson for this week. Okay, for those of you that are having a hard time understanding or knowing if your value is correct or not, I'm going to show you exactly how you know if you're doing the right thing or you're not. Now, I have to tilt this paper a bit because of the glare. Here I have two values. And the glare that they reflect really inhibits this process. If you were doing it straight up, you would be able to see. So while I do this, I want you to blur your vision. And obviously I can't hear you, so I'm just going to continue. But in your mind, notice and stop. Or in your mind, say stop when you see the value start to dissipate. So I'm going to tilt this up. And at this point, I want you to blur your vision. And tell me where the value starts to dissipate. Let's do that one more time. If you stopped, or in your mind, if you stopped at around five, and remember, in order to do this successfully, you have to blur your vision. So you could have stopped at five or six, six, on the video, that's exactly correct. In real life, the five is more correct than the six, but maybe due to the settings, the six is correct on the video. So if you said stop at six because that blends, then you are correct. And that's how you check if your value is correct. Um, if I do this with it facing down, it doesn't work because there's too much glare. So you can blur your vision right now. And as I tilt this up, you'll see it starts to disappear because the glare starts to fade. Does it start to disappear here on the five on the camera? No. Does it disappear like that anywhere else? No, because the value is six on camera. So that's how you check value. Here I have another value, a much lighter value. And I'll ask you to do the same thing. Just blur your vision and tell me where it disappears. Now you can see it's starting to match and bam, right there. So this is a value of two and I know that's very light, but you'll see it. You see when I go to one, you see it. Or when I go to zero, you see it. But on two, blur your vision and it disappears. All right, now just quickly, I'm going to do that same thing, but I'm going to blur the camera a bit for those of you that have a hard time blurring your vision, just so you could see what it's like. So this is the first one we used. And again, I have to tilt, I have to tilt it a bit so it doesn't reflect. And here we're starting at one, three, four, five, 
and six, and you can see it starts to fade a lot. So it's blending into six. You have seven, right here is eight, and it even starts to look lighter in eight, nine, and 10, it's lighter. All right, now let's do the lighter value. And obviously we're gonna start from this end because we'd get there too soon from the other end. Here we're crossing six, five, four, three, and two. And that value blends perfectly into two. That's how you check your values. That's the purpose of blurring your vision. Hopefully you guys understand that. And when you check your work, you blur your vision. If it looks like whatever you're doing will melt into the reference, then that's the correct value. So here's an example of a value scale. And we're gonna try to do something like this, uh, but we're gonna make two different ones only to five. We're gonna blend one. These aren't blended, but in the demo that I'm gonna show you, it will be, or I'm gonna try to blend it. And what I want you to notice here is even digitally, these values are all different. And that's the most important thing that we're trying to achieve. We're trying to achieve uh, making them all different. So they're different values and that none of them look the same. If you have any doubts on two of them, maybe if they look the same, just blur your vision. And if they blend into each other, then you know that one needs to be either lighter or one needs to be either darker. So this is a value scale and this is what we're going to create. Okay. Okay. All that's left is the actual assignment. So here we go. So we're not going to do uh, 10 different values because we're distance learning and I don't want to make this particularly harder than it needs to be. What we're going to do is we're going to do five different values. You're going to do, uh, the top is not going to be blended and the bottom is going to be blended. So the first thing you want to do is you want to number this one, two, three, four, and five, uh, put your name here. And then your period at the bottom uh, right corner. And now very, very lightly, what you want to do is you're going to make like a, a rectangle. Very lightly on the top and you're going to make a rectangle on the bottom. And very lightly, you want to split this up. Both of them. Now, uh, this is going to be our darkest. And this is going to be our lightest value. And the way that you are going to make this light is by applying very little pressure. So you could hold the pencil from the back when you're applying light pressure and you're just going to hatch in one direction. Now you can get a little tissue to spread that value around to make it even. Uh, this isn't, tissue. This is actually just a little bit of toilet paper. And that's your lightest value. Now let's do the darkest value. And for this, we're going to move up on the pencil a bit so we could apply more pressure. It's important to keep your pencil sharp. And you're going to hatch while applying a lot of pressure. And you see here, I applied a bit more pressure so it's darker. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to even it out. And you can see I'm lifting the pencil every time I do, I do that. Now I'm gonna cross hatch, which means I'm gonna go in the opposite direction and you can see how it gets darker.
Now for our darkest value, that's still not dark enough. So now I'm gonna go up and down. And now I still don't think that's dark enough, so I'm gonna go left to right. And I am not zigzagging, I'm lifting the pencil up. Now, I'm actually gonna do that one more time because that has four layers on it. I'm gonna give it a fifth layer to coincide with its number. But now I have to start over. So now I go back to the original, which is in this direction. Ah, just one more for good measure. Now, if I tilt that, you can see that it's much darker because we have glare since we're working on a table, but in front of you, it should be uh, a little bit darker than, than here if you tilt it. Not because you probably still have glare wherever you are. So over here for the four, I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to uh, not do as many layers. And the key here is just to make sure that the values are different. But this four should still be dark. Not as dark as this, but it should be dark. Right now it's way too light. And it helps to hold the pencil from the back. That way you get um, to cover the whole area. You see how much range of motion I have? If I hold the pencil from the front, which is good for very dark values to apply a lot of pressure, but it really limits your range of motion, okay? Now you can see I am, it is. it does seem like I'm adding more layers, but I'm not applying as much pressure as I did. So I'm not pushing as hard as I did with this. So it's still not as dark. I don't really wanna make it any darker than that. I think that's pretty good because what we're aiming for is clear distinction between these values. So you can see that this one is uh, lighter than this one. So for the number three, it's uh, very similar, but we wanna be even lighter than the four. And don't worry about, you know, running into, these values running into each other Remember to change direction when you hatch and you cross hatch. And try not to zigzag. I know it may be difficult, but try not to. Uh, one thing that you do have to keep in mind is if you decide to use a tissue to kind of make the value the even it out, tissues actually will make uh, it look lighter because you're you're lifting the graphite off of off of the the paper. It is a good tool to help kind of even the value. But look, when I do it here, you see it actually becomes lighter. And that's not always what you want, right? But it, it, does, it does give a nice effect. If it becomes too light, 
then you'll have to go back in and maybe add another layer. But that tissue is gonna be super helpful when we uh, blend these values, which in turn is gonna be very helpful for the next assignment when we create three-dimensional objects. And this tissue might actually darken because I now I feel like my my one is gonna be too light. So um, I wanna darken it a bit. Now I feel like it's too dark. But that's that's good that that happened. So I'm getting a fresh tissue to try to lift some of that value off and, and lighten it a bit more so you can see what that's like. But if it was if it was still too dark, which I, I think it is still too dark, then you can get an eraser. And using an eraser, you can lift some of the graphite off as well. And with the eraser, what you would do is to try to keep it as even as possible, is you would just hatch and cross hatch as well. Oh, another a bit of advice is just use a sheet of paper to uh, cover the values that you've already done. So you don't get graphite all over your hand. And with this eraser, I'm gonna hatch. And that's just gonna lift some graphite off. And you could cross hatch as well. And now with a clean a tissue, you can spread that around, kind of even it out. I still feel like it's there's still some gaps. So I could go in very, very lightly without applying very much pressure at all and just give it a very thin layer. Uh, now let's go ahead and do two, which has to be somewhere between one and three. But since one got so dark, uh, it might be a little tricky, but you know what? Let's go for it. We might have to darken uh, three. So I'm gonna go ahead, use my tissue again, and let's see what happens. And we'll go from there. Now, if I blur my vision, this is too similar to one. So I'm gonna have to add maybe another very thin layer. my vision and now I'm starting to notice it's too similar to three so this is where this assignment starts to get a little tricky if you blur your vision you'll see that two and three are matching and so I'm gonna make three a little bit darker by adding a thin layer trying not to get it too similar to four when I do that And I think that that is pretty good right there. 
uh, I'm going to push four a little bit deeper into the, uh, you know, the darker area. So these three are cl clearly different. Um, I think three and two are, are also clearly different, but I still feel like one is too similar. So I'm going to go pretty heavy with the eraser for one. And uh, now I'm going to try to blend that. And now just to cover up those white areas that I've created, I am going to go kind of very lightly and give it another layer. So that is one. Now you're going to do the same thing uh, right below it, but then we're going to work on just making sure that we blend them. So I'm going to do the next one off camera. So you don't have to see all of that again. Just do it the exact same way. And then I'll come back just for the blending part of it. So here you can see that uh, the second one is done. And now what we want to do is we just want to blend these values together. Now, how do you do that? Uh, one way to do it is just by hatching and cross hatching in between the two values, but you have to vary the pressure of the line and the darker value. For instance, when I'm going through these values, I'm going to put pressure on the darker value and then I'm going to start to lighten up. Um, meaning to say that the, the value can change even within a line. So if I put pressure here, let me give you an example and then I loosen up the pressure and I put pressure, you can see that the value becomes lighter right around here. And what you wanna do is you wanna do that and hatch kind of getting lighter and lighter right on the edge. And this takes some practice and if you don't get it perfect, then that's okay, don't, just try your best. I, even I, I don't get it perfect. Don't, don't beat yourself up. And then you could start to lighten over here. So you keep going and you get lighter and lighter. Hatching and cross hatching. And you could already see that that line that was kind of separating the two of those is starting to, to become lighter and starting to break up. And then um, you got to be careful. You don't want to lighten it too much, but you can take a tissue and just go over it with one, one layer and then stop. Uh, students have a tendency to overuse the tissue. So, and that's a pretty good blend. And at the end of all of this, I'll show you what it, what it means to overuse the tissue. If you overuse the tissue, everything is just going to look the same. And we have a term for that. It's called muddy and you don't want things to be muddy. So I'm gonna do the same thing over here. Of course, varying the pressure based on the different values. And I don't even think this one needs the tissue. So now I'm, I'm just gonna keep it lighter there. Same thing over here. See, I'm changing the direction. I'm hatching and cross hatching between that separation to make those values blur with each other. And I don't think that needs the tissue either. And last but not least, I'm going to do it over here while applying more pressure. And I'm kind of doing, let me show you what I'm doing there. I'm, go I'm going like this. So there, think of it like little X's. And that's, that's how I'm blending that. And that's going to be really important when you have to do the sphere in the next assignment, because a sphere is round and it's like all value. And I think that's pretty good. So you can see that there's a clear separation between these and then these are more blended. Now, uh, 
don't do this, right? Do not do this. If you're watching this, do not do this next part. I'm gonna show you a mistake that students make that will ruin the work. So again, disclaimer, do not do this. So right here, this is where you stop and this is the end of the assignment. Now I'm gonna show you what not to do. Do not get your tissue because right now all of our values are different and that's what we want. S some students will do this. This is overusing your blending tool, having no control over it whatsoever, and it just makes all of the values look the same. And that's what we call muddy, okay? There's no difference between any of this. It's all the same. It's all the same value, except maybe the, the five, which is still dark. That's what not to do. Do not get carried away with your tissue because you're going to ruin your work. And this, I'm not gonna give you credit for this, okay? So don't, do not, do not do. The way it was before was just fine. It was actually pretty good. And I hope you guys do well on this assignment and that you get an A. And I'm gonna send it back to myself in class. I'll see you guys in a second.